infected. Female deer is laying uninfected eggs in the fall of year two. Now you go back, where we go? Wait on this side, where do I go? Okay, right. Infected nymphs feed on animals and humans, introducing Oriel into humans. Now, if a nymphs developed into adult ticks over summer like year two, but if you feed off the human, you can pass this around. Don't memorize the whole thing. Just know this is a two-year process. For this whole thing to go through. How does it get to humans? Like by eating deer? Right, right here. The infected nymphs are going to feed on animals and human humans right here. Nymphs are going to take over here too. They keep going around and around and around. Now, what is diagnostic for Lyme disease? It shows a broad range of signs and symptoms, three phases of disease and untreated patients. This is diagnostic. If you see a red bullseye rash anywhere, that's going to tell you right away you're dealing with what? Lyme disease in particular. So it's called expanding red bullseye rash occurs in infectious site. Now, it doesn't happen in all patients. But all people infected with Lyme disease actually come out with this rash, but it's pretty, pretty common. Neurological uh, symptoms and cardiac dysfunction can be the second part. Severe arthritis that can last four years. Again, this is another organism where your immune system overreacts to it and you end up getting autoimmune arthritis. And that is basically untreatable. I mean, not untreatable, but it's uncurable. Is it like rheumatoid arthritis? Kind of, yeah. Okay. So this results, and this is the bad, this is the, the bad part about untreated Lyme disease. Because it's going to get pretty severe, and there's no way to cure it. Can you treat it with antibiotics at this stage? No. No. Why not? Because it's already ruined the... Right, it's immunologic. It's already, it's already, your immune system's already going after you, so it's pretty much a done deal at this point. For you. So you can just do the same thing you do with rheumatoid arthritis at this point. All right. Increase in case in the United States, Humans and Culture Association for Yellow Infected Deer Ticks. Why? I want two reasons. It used to be isolated very far up in the Northeast. We talked about that in the Midwest. Is it because we're expanding? We're getting closer well, to. Expanding, but expanding. <laughs> well, our population's expanding. We're going deeper into the. Two things: population expansion into the infected, more into the outdoors. Everybody wants all the people want to live out. It's very funny this happens in Austin a lot. You have these people who want to live out in nature, and it's because you know it's nice, but they don't want all the ickiness that goes along with living out in nature, <laughs> like all those deer and all those animals out there. But that's part of it. We're moving out and people are tending, a lot of people are tending to move out there. What's another one along with hunting? What did I say? I think I brought it up here before. What happened the last decade or so? Now I'm starting to die off now a little bit. What was a big trend in terms of recreation in the last, last decade? Camping. Camping. A lot of people have been a lot of outdoor activities. Not just camping, but jogging in the outdoors, biking in the outdoors, things like that. That also increased. So anytime that increases, you're going to increase your odds of interacting. So again, with all of these tick-borne illnesses, as long as you get the ticks off, what? Within six hours? Relatively quick. You're, you're, you're usually going to be okay. All right, again, so this map, this is the, no, this is the, the distribution, but I'm, I wish I knew how old this map was. Because now, what does the distribution look like? Nice. This is moved way down this way and way over this way, too. Mm -hmm. Number of cases have gone up steadily since again. What happened in 2000 to this big increase in more recreation, outdoor recreation activity? So diagnosis of signs and symptoms, serological tests, ELISA, they're going to look for antibodies to the bacteria. Um, Antimicrobial drugs, drugs are effective at treating which stage? First. Stage one. Treating the later stages is a difficult symptom for primary result, whatever you want over this, right? It's autoimmune. Prevention is best achieved by avoiding ticks. Like who doesn't try to avoid ticks? We're going to hang out with some ticks. <laughs> All right, relapsing fever is a last order, or last order, relapsing fever. 
Reoccurrence is a common, Borreliola reoccurrence is a common agent transmitting human to, <coughs> to humans by the human body louse, and this is endemic to Africa and South America. But what does that mean now? Do you think it's going to be endemic to South America and Africa for very long? No, it's going to move. Or, or well, it's still going to be endemic there, if I didn't word that quite correctly. Is it going to be endemic anywhere else? Yeah. More than likely, body lysis is going to move around. Okay. Several species can cause the disease transmitted to humans by soft ticks, and again, can occur worldwide. <coughs> That's tick borne is mouse borne. Right, oh, hmm? the Lewis is mouse borne? No, you've got mouse borne. Oh, Louse. Louse. I thought you said mouse, like no, Mickey. Mouse. Mouse. <laughs> okay, sorry. Mice born, mouse born, and you got tick born. Two different species. Well, several species of tick born. All right. Character, the one I want you to know about relapsing fever is it's characterized by recurring episodes of septicemia and fever. So you're going to get these ups and downs and ups and downs with this due to the body's repeated efforts to try and remove the spirochetes. So you're sort of in a what with this battle? What are you going to kind of? Chronic? Not chronic, because you're going to use it, but you'll usually get rid of it. Oh. But you're, sort of, you're in a, you're in a yeah, this constant battle, back and forth battle with this, with this particular organism. So first antigenic challenge, the first time it's, it sprouts up, you're going to have what? Days following infection, you're going to have signs and symptoms, it's going to be about what? Almost two weeks. Oh. Then it's going to go what? First go antibody down. response, you knock it down. Second antigenic challenge, this is that we're not fever. It's going to spring back up. However, what should be happening? Your Since body will have adaptive immune responses kick in. You're going to have a second and oh, sorry, second immune response is going to what? Decrease the time um. of the disease. Then third antigenic challenge is going to pop up again. But by now, what does your immune system do every time it gets challenged by the same organism? Create be like the memory B cells. You've got memory cells from memory B cells, memory T cells. But what does your immune system do every time? Okay, I want to go back over the immune system because this is kind of something for a quick to really get to it. You all remember that when you first get challenged, right? After about three days or so, what happens? What do you start doing? You start creating the... Antibody. But which one do you start making first? Um, the... Anybody remember? You mean well, the T's one? make the B's at first and then the oh. other ones. You make IgM first. That's the first oh, one that comes out. Antibody. Probably made that it's going to be a little bit quicker. It's not quite as precise. It goes up and then you start making that. In about two weeks, what do you start making? IgG, Ig, C, Ig, G, E, IgG. Ig, which is your main antibody, right? Uh -huh. So this is the first challenge. Second challenge. What's going to happen? Right away. I'm not going to put a little line. What's going to happen? You've got memory stuff. What happened? Um, they go into effect. <laughs> What happens right away? They start fighting. They they go at them. What happens? Words. What do you start making? Is that right? You start making IgG right away, right? Bam. IgG oh, I see what you're up. asking. A lot of people, the idea behind that is a lot of people, when you're reinfected, you even know you've been infected. No. No, because IgG comes up so fast, you can kick it down. What else starts coming up right about here about three days later? Does, does your immune system say, oh, we already have it. we already have some antibodies, nobody else do anything? Oh, you B-cell, you B-cell, you know, there's the other spike for a while. <laughs> That's what it looks like in the book. It's like you've got this one thing that comes out. It's not. You start making Ig in again. And then down here later, you're going to start making C's? IgCs? IgG again. What? Hmm? Okay. Because it's interacting with another B cell. Mm -hmm. and so now this B cell is mature and starts making antibodies. And so every time you get challenged with something, your immune system gets more and more refined and gets better and better and better fighting.
So observed from this, uh, observational spider keeps the primary method for diagnosis. Successful treatment of antimicrobials again. Avoid takes lice, good personal hygiene, and use chemical workouts. Ventral spirillia, modal obligatory aerobic bacteria found in numerous wild and domestic animals. Just letting you know right now, this is becoming an increasing, or what they could call a re-emerging infection. Okay, it enters the body through skin or the mucous membranes, travels through the bloodstream, and causes hemorrhaging, liver, and kidney dysfunction. This can be fatal. Occurs worldwide. Still treatable with penicillin. But again, since it's endemic, I'm not endemic, since it's ubiquitous everywhere, right? Are you ever going to get rid of this one? No. No. So just remember this is one that's coming back up. This is one I want to spend some time on because this is becoming a huge problem. Lithosporillium, just you know for this one. Yeah, so let's not even worry about it. I just want to let you guys know out right now up front. It's, it's one that you guys may come across later on. It's becoming more and more common. Right. But for the test, don't worry about it? No, it's not worry. we got plenty of stuff in here. I want to spend more time on some of the other stuff. Vibrio. Do you remember what Vibrios are? Why they're called Vibrio? What they look like? Yeah. They're kind of comma shaped. Found in the water <coughs> environments worldwide. <coughs> this is what they look like. It's where they get that name Vibrio. They get that sort of comma shape on them. They're just curved rod spots. Pathogenesis, common species to affect humans. Bacteria can survive in fresh water. A lot of bacteria don't do super well in fresh water. How come? <coughs> Temperature can be part of it. What else? Variation in temperature. Well, uh, some of them need um, salt, right? Well, so yeah, some of the, um, plus they get, they get, even though they can survive against osmotic pressure, it still yeah. exerts what on them. They're still getting that pressure on them, right? They're still getting that influx of water and everything else. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's plenty of stuff in, in So if I put a bacteria in just pure fresh water and put it in the refrigerator, is it going to permanently be okay? No. How long is he going to live? Maybe short. How Days? long is it? You guys done that? If you have it already in fresh water, mm -hmm. we used to, it'll last a couple weeks. Oh. But after that, they start to die off. Even if they're even if they're cold, even if they're not multiplying or growing, mm -hmm. they still just don't do well. And that's all just based on pressure, osmotic yeah, pressure. Yeah, oh. lack of nutrients, or lack of food, and, and plus the fresh water, they just doesn't do well. They don't like they just sort of. The one I want you to know right now, big one is cholera. Vibrio cholera, humans infected by ingestion of contaminated food and water. What source is that called? What's the name of that? Rodent of infection? Ingesting, uh, foodborne? No. It could be foodborne, but what's it called? What gets on the food, probably? Droplet. Yeah, it's going to be food. Mouth, or food, food, mouth oh, food and mouth disease. That's a viral disease, but okay. Okay. Oh, this is a little bit different. This is still going to be fecal oral for the most part. Found in most areas of poor sewage and water treatment, that should be done right here. They call it rice water stool. We have cholera. So basically, with cholera, the water goes in, it the water comes out. Yeah. <laughs> Most important variance factor is cholera toxin. So, know that. It's an important one. Of severe loss of fluid and electrolytes, and this has a high mortality rate if left untreated, even in adults. Most of the other diarrheal diseases are only fatal in what? Children. Children. And the old elderly. Things that can be hydrated very fast. Cholera will kill the healthy adults. Can I show you this little picture right here before? Mm -mm. This is called a cholera bed. What do you think that is? Bedpan? Nope. Nope. Let me 
There's the pillow. There's a hole. Oh, bucket. There's a bucket. The whole point is to do what? Catch everything. Yeah. Keep them hydrated. Water goes in. Water comes out. This is a really severe disease. My little brother actually caught this. <gasps> what? Yeah, this is still alive. <laughs> and were you guys here in the United States? How did you? No, he was in Ecuador, and he went oh. down one of the rivers, and he went down one of the indigenous tribes, and they had this stuff. Have you ever heard of Bolkin? I think it's called. A lot of those, a lot of the indigenous tribes down there, they'll ferment different fruits by spitting in it. <laughs> they get the yeast in there and get it to ferment. You ever heard of that? Okay, no. Never heard of that. A, I'm not drinking anything anybody spitting. Period. I don't care. Secondly, so he decided to try that because he likes to eat that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> he knew there was spit in there and he still oh, wanted to? Oh, yeah. No, it's fermented. I guess, you know, drink that a little bit. The problem is there was a little extra seasoning in this particular drink, but it happened to be very old color. So he came out of cholera. He also ate street food in Cambodia and got a parasite, so, you know. Oh, my gosh. All right, this is a gimmick right here. These are, I mean, these are out cholera outbreaks. So initial epidemic, 1991. August 1991, it's going to be some here, boom, 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 and then it's going to move out here. And, they, and you see this is where he was in Ecuador. Give you one. <laughs> February 1992, it's doing what? Traveling and getting worse. So this is the Marauders pandemic. Now by 94, it's moving down into where? Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador. Second wave epidemic in October 2010. What happened here? Travel. Also moved up. What happened right there? What's that little island right there? That's Puerto Rico, Cuba. What's Cuba? What's the one that's cut in half? Costa Rica, isn't it? Haiti. <laughs> Yeah, 2003 was, okay. Also, what's the middle? No, let's just spend that one. Let's spend that one. What happened to Haiti back in 2000, I think it was 11? Oh, that, uh, earthquake. Oh. He, got, he got hammered by an earthquake. Oh. Poor Haiti just gets hammered all the time. He got hammered by an earthquake. The UN sent in some peacekeepers to help with the, um, one to help make sure there's no looting, all the stuff going on, and to help with the repairs and the rebuilding of the infrastructure. One of the Pakistani peacekeepers brought a little friend with him from Pakistan. Massive cholera outbreak. Because wow. what, why was this just a, an accident waiting to happen? They didn't have like uh, available water, so they had to just. They had limited available drinking water, and all their infrastructure was trashed, and as soon as that main water supply got contaminated, bam. So don't memorize this, but cholera toxin binds the memory to epithelial cells, and you just get a mess. I just don't want to on the whole pathway. But what happens here? If you get burned aside from AMP, you get massive release of what? Basically salt into your GI tract, sodium and chloride ions, right? What follows sodium? Water. Water. So as soon as all that dumps into there, you get water flow. Water flows electrolytes in the room. Water flows electrolytes. I don't know. Part of that one. Electrolytes go in. What did we write that? What did we write that? And then the water's going to follow it. And it just is just right through you. And it really is kind of, it looks, you've ever seen the rice water? What does it look like? It's like water that's got a little bit of milk poured in it, kind of, right? And it kind of evaporated. Yeah, it just goes, that's one of what's in it goes right through. <coughs> All right, we're going to diagnose based on what? Characteristic diarrhea. If you guys go somewhere else have water and you're pooping out milk, you got cholera. Okay, you can do fluid electrolyte replacement, but it's got to be constant. Usually it's going to be intravenous. Antimicrobial cells can reduce the exotoxin production in the volume of diarrhea. This is one of the ones where you actually want to try and put somebody else's antibodies in. There's a vaccine for it, but again, all these, what's going to be the treatment? I mean, what's going to be the preventive measure? Don't drink dirty water. You're still drinking dirty water. <laughs> I have a question. So, Gabriel yeah. is like the main, what is like the main source of, of that? What we have? Cholera. Cholera. Yeah, Gabriel cholera, huh? that's the organism. 
And it, it, the toxin it releases called cholera. Toxin. What's what's the organism? Vibrio cholera. Vibrio. That's actually an organism. Yeah. And then for for real, will be what I think. Cholera is the disease, yeah, and it's caused by vibrio cholera. And it's also cholera toxin. Which I'm actually trying to use for example. All right. These are two more that are up and coming right now. Okay. Perihemolytis results from ingestion of shellfish, causes cholera like gastroenteritis. Do you hear like raw oysters? <laughs> well, we Not no. anymore. No. No. I don't like raw anything. Uh, I'm getting hungry thinking about it. <laughs> but this is the reason they worry about you're only supposed to eat oysters from the ocean, if, well, not like they go anywhere else. You're only supposed to eat oysters in particular seasons because of the temperature. When the water gets warm, you can get blooms of perihemolyticus inside of the oysters. And since they're not cooked, you're in trouble. <laughs> So when you ask for the genus, it's going to be Vibrio. When you ask for the disease, it'll be cholera or paralytic mm -hmm. or whatever. Well, the yeah, yeah. Of these. yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll be very careful about it. Though, though. <laughs> this is the really bad one. This one's bad enough. And this can really do some damage to, 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 to people, especially if you're immune compromised. This one is due to consumption, contaminating cell fish, or wound infections. So two different manifestations from this particular one. This one you really need to know. Okay? Consumption, we already talked about that. Due to washing wounds with contaminated seawater. What do they mean by washing wounds? Washing wounds? Well, like if, you, like if you're like if you at the beach and you get cut and you just use the seawater to... To wash it up. But that's what I don't like where this, this was worded. Not just washing wounds. If you're walking in an ocean and you cut your foot, in particular things with coral reefs and things around like that, where there's coral, you can introduce this into the room right then and there. And I happened to a guy, there was a guy in the news, who's a fisherman. Um, God, I think it was in September, October. No, it must have been September, it's still relatively warm. He got this infection, he went home, he ended up losing again, just like some of the other ones. Both of his legs and an arm, wow. or something else. So oh, this is a nasty one. Yeah. So that we would just like only be worried with lacerations or abrasions as well. Yes. Yeah. Anything you can get in there, you worry about it. Okay. So how long does it take for it to manifest? The word yeah, to it can period of a few days. Days. The problem is, you, in the initial symptoms, you're just going to be you're going to feel kind of sick, and, and that's the problem. The guy can think of the hospital for that little bit. That. But like I said right here, in this case, these, inf these, in yeah. these infections can be what? Fatal. Fatal. And this is a really big one they're worried about now. Why are they worried about it? More now. Is it like the same reason where people are going more outdoors, so they're going to the beach? No, people are going to the beaches for years and years and years and years. I mean, think about it, forever. That's been one of the original sort of outdoor activities for a long time. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to debate the, the, the cause of the beach, you know, but what's happening? to the ocean waters right now. Oh, they're getting more polluted. They're warming up. No, they're warming up too. Well, they're getting more polluted too, but they're also warming up so much too. Oh. So they're worried this may become more and more of an issue. And right here. Oh, The result of gill alterations or abrasions come to direct contact with the not by the very campus. The infection can begin with redness, swelling, and pinch pain around the site. Off of fluid filled vistas develop and progress to tissue necrosis, and then that necrosis looks just like what? Gangrene. Okay. And what causes the gas gangrene? It's, uh, it's a wound. I love what that type right back in Wound, uh, it's a deep penetrating wound. No, well, we have to say about that. But <laughs> uh, the bacteria. Um, yeah, the bacteria. <laughs> um, um, Which one? Anyone? The, the, is it's the one with the C? What, Pyrogenes is strep. Strep? Isn't it? Nope. Uh, isn't it a really hard test? Clostridium perfringi, good. I said the C one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How about 50% of the patients with EB1 will require surgery or what? Amputation. This is a really nasty bug. If I was that guy, just take that finger right now. Yes. All right. 
Oh, my favorite. Oh, gosh. My other favorite. So this one's going to be on the test? Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. I've done tons and tons of research on candy. That's what we call it for fun. <laughs> Campylobacter jejuni. This is likely, likely most common cause of cancer that arrives in the United States. Pretty much is the most likely cause is Campylobacter. Okay. Many animals serve as a reservoir for it. Again, all these do. Humans affect by consuming contaminated food, milk, or water. Poultry is the most common source of infection. So when you hear about salmonella on chicken, you should really be more worried about what? Campylobacter. Infectious, infections produce self-limiting, bloody, and frequent <laughs> diarrhea. It's another one of the diarrheal diseases. Let's see if it goes with so, the, why do you like what this? Are the, what are the main diarrheal diseases that we covered? E. coli. You know, like e. coli. E. coli. Um, listeria, right? Salmonella. Salmonella. Um, Not listeria, no, that one gets in your system. That's not really one of the big ones. E. coli? E. coli, salmonella, mm -hmm. shigella. Shigella. Cholera, and campylobacter. <sighs> Proper food handling of preparation can reduce the spread of bacteria. So it's about the same, same, same song and dance, guys. I just want you to know which one which. Okay. <clears throat> what is the H. pylori cause? Hmm? Which one? Ulcers. Yes, ulcers. All right. This is the one ulcers. now that found out a few years ago that 95%, or depending on the statistics, of all ulcers are caused by a pylori infection. Oh, is that the one where the scientists like drank it to see if that's what caused it? Uh, I don't know. Did he really? Yeah, like because nobody believed him, so he went in. Wait, so we're already over Kathy? No. That's it. What was so good about it? Why do you like it so much? I did research on it for about two years. Oh. I'm going to tell you guys I've done a bunch of research on it. Developing assays for detection of all these people. All right. Yeah, it's kind of, sorry, it was a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why since all of these cause diarrhea, then I guess that's why they diagnose you just with a broad, you know, you just have gastroenteritis yeah. to this with fluids in. Right, yeah. And then and, and, and some of like cholera is going to be, the, the, the type of diarrhea is going to be diagnostic with that and everything else. So most of these are going to be self limiting The only one, the only one aside from cholera they're going to make you worry about in an adult. Oh, look, some of the E. coli is be bad, but they're usually worse on children. All of 5, 7, 8, 7 is usually worse in kids. We get the hemolytic uric syndrome. What, but what is the other one I said? It can cause systemic illness. And it's diarrhea? It has mm -hmm. to do with diarrhea? Okay, it has systemic. Oh. Remember, it goes through and destroys the Salmonella lining of the you know, upper intestinal. Oh, yeah, and that the sloughing off, right? Is that the one? No, that's going to be, that would be C. diff. That's another one because of, that's a little bit different. He didn't cause the battery too much throughout my belt. It's not using infectious. Well, yeah. no. not people who are those for battery. And it goes through. Salmonella. Stomach. Remember, salmonella can get through the and get in the lining. It can work its way through, destroy the intestinal cells, get in the bloodstream, and then it can evade the neutrophils. Oh, that's right, because it gets right. too... Ingestion of bacteria uh, from contaminated <coughs> hands, well watered, and full lights. Is it, um, is it correct to think like things that can get into your immune system are systemic? Like, is that a way to th remember that? In your immune system? Yeah, or? like uh, salmonella and listeria. Well, your immune system's going to go after everything eventually. Right? Yeah, but those ones hide in the immune... Like, oh, oh, uh, uh, Is that a good way to no, think of that? No, no, because some of them just get in the bloodstream and travel freely in the bloodstream once they get in. Okay, so, so it, no. It would, I wouldn't... I want to tie yeah, those things together. Yeah, no. Yeah, you can't be careful on that. Okay. No, right. Okay. Cause of gastroenteritis and what? That's big ulcer. Good. Numerous various factors enable it to colonize the stomach. Kind of know these. This is kind of the way it works. Which is kind of this is an interesting adaptation for this bacteria because the stomach does what to most bacteria? Kills it. It kills most of them, right? Very that's why the whole argument with probiotics. 
Who are we talking about? Was somebody talking about taking too many probiotics in the class? That's I think Sam. Mm -hmm. Sam. Oh, you. With all that yogurt and all that stuff. No, no, Sam. That's Sam, we're here. Yeah, He's not here close. today. Um, why am I talking about it? <laughs> <laughs> They're, They're, She'll probably see the video later. No, it, it, it replenishes it, but they've tapped that out so people take too many of them now, and they're, they're getting what they call this brain fog. So mm. they get kind of confused and stuff and everything else, and they're sort of tying it back that these people were sort of were taking too much of it. Mm. Oh, yeah, I'm thinking about too many antibiotics. Too many antibiotics, yeah. Yeah, so they so, so, so take probiotics. And to to counteract that. And now there's also some question as whether that really even works that well. I mean, if it were me, I'd go down to Sam's and buy one of the cheap ones to take it. It's not going to hurt you, right? Yeah. All right. Well, Gentlemen got the bacteria burrow through the stomach lining, and he usually facilitates binding the gastric cells, and they got enzymes that help neutralize the acids, the stomach acid, where they are. I'm kind of cute. <laughs> so, probiotic is um, bacteria. Yeah. Why would you want to take that? It's good because bacteria. Because you've got all that tons of bacteria inside you already, and if you take a bunch of antibiotics, you kill a lot of that off, and that helps protect you. In fact, you're finding your gut microflora now. They just tied it to something else. I forgot what it was. But it plays a huge role in your body. Mm -hmm. So you want to play. So the bacteria invade, they grow through the mucous membrane, the mucous membrane, the mucous layer. Helobacter's toxins and inflammation cause the layer of the mucus to become what? Thin. Thin so they can get through it. Now, what's actually causing the ulcer though is what? Acid. The gastric juices, but what's leading to that? The whole that it makes. Colonization by the pylori. So um. they can invade the stomach, they burrow in there, and they start getting, destroy the lining in your stomach. All right. <clears throat> this one kind of interesting, guys. Do you know how they test for it? I'm going to look right here. Here's a new test for it. Does anybody know what it is? Urease test? Because I got that. It uh -huh. was like the worst thing ever. I got that and they made me test. Like she told me it was some radioactive material. Wait, she, she made it into a mix. Oh my god, this was just it very so right? bad. Uh, I it don't tasted know. bad or it hurt? It, very it, just, they have it tasted you. bad, but that hurt really bad. Oh. So then how do they test you for it though? It, it, it was, I don't know, she mixed some powdery liquid into, like, a, into a thick solution and then I drank it and she made me blow into like a yeah. little balloon. So, yeah, it's a breath test. They use that yeah. breath test for it. So now they do, they, they give you, I don't, I don't know if it's radioactive, I'm even looking at that. Might be, I guess. Um, that's what she does. Um, but yeah, it's a new breath test, so it's pretty quick. The problem with it is, so for making good hygiene, adequate food treatment, proper food handling, the problem with H. pylori is what? Is it becoming resistant? And we're all done. Nope. What's the problem? What did you get from it? An ulcer? Did you get an ulcer? They put you on the proton pump and inhibitors too? They put me on the blood. Probably the second. You put you on the the second. You can't really eat when you have an ulcer. Yeah, you can eat. I mean, just somebody that hurts for a while. I mean, I don't know. I've never had one. I mean, <laughs> that would be your, I would have heard. I couldn't eat. Couldn't eat? Like, yeah, I didn't have it. Yeah. Or drink. It was bad. Drink what? Because <laughs> 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 yeah, I friend had one and she thought that she had got in here from a mom, but now I know. Uh, now you can get, you can get <laughs> alcohol induced gastro, uh, gastritis. Um, but the, they've also tied in not just the peptic ulcers, they've also tied to a food, which is, I'm glad you were treated for it, you don't have to worry about it. Because many are asymptomatic for it. But they, um, They've also tied it to a large increase in stomach cancer. I knew it. Two. All right, guys, any questions on anything? We'll finish these up. I'll post it up. Hopefully, I'll work on it tonight. If not, I'll get it to you guys by tomorrow. And I'll give you exactly. I'll, I'll post it, yeah. And I'll tell you exactly what I want you guys to know. Mm -hmm. This organism is this, this organism is this. All right? And then we'll do the parasites next week, and then you guys are ready to meet. Mm -hmm. So, I'm a new